Anna. I'm going to introduce me a little bit uh, more properly uh, later on. But just to give you a few heads up about um, how it's going to be the class today, you've noticed that there's a lot of people here tonight. So uh, we going to are going to. I can hear myself. Sorry, my maybe guess. if I don't. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I was just um, going to tell you how things are going to um, uh, be organized for tonight. So this is our first open class of the year. So this is the time that we have the opportunity to introduce to you uh, a little bit of what we're reading this first semester of 2023. Um, but also to uh, explain to you how our method works, right? And it's a lot of things to do in one hour and a half, right? We, we know that. Um, but uh, for that reason, we ask you just like to leave the comments for the end um, of the class. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about a, a book a month, introduce ourselves properly, and then we begin analyzing the short story together. And afterwards, we open for comments that you can just open your, your mic and comment on, but we just ask you to leave it to um, the end of the class. And even if it goes a little bit further than half past eight, no problem for us, but just so we have the time to um, uh, present to you everything that we have planned for tonight. Okay, good. All right, so let's go. Out. So... Okay, guys, so I'll just repeat what Anna just said. We're very, very glad to see you all here. I'm Audio, and well, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'm one of the teachers here at A Book A Month. It's just the two of us, Anna and myself. And well, Anna is a postdoc. She, she has just finished her postdoc at the Missilla uh, Center, connected to the University of, of Cologne, even though she was doing that in Sao Paulo, in the Sebrap. She's a PhD in comparative literature, and she also holds a master's in, in literature, um, which she, she got at the University of Chef. And she is the founder of a book a month, so, so she is my boss, let's put it this way. <laughs> I am, I am Aurelio Lustosa Guerrero. I'm also a PhD in, in comparative literature. Uh, can you pass a slide, Anna? And... Um, my specialization is in, in comparative literature and the medical humanities. Um, I, I, I was awarded my PhD in Italy and as well as my master's in literature at the University of Bologna. And I also host a podcast, which is in Portuguese, actually, by the way, called Literatura Viral. If you never heard about it, um, you can search for it in Spotify or it's free. It's freely available. And, and I talk about literature and art and history in general. So you see something that is similar to what we do in a book a month, but, but also quite different. Um, can you go ahead, Anna? Over there, you can find many episodes in which I discuss authors or texts from English and American literature, and some of which were already analyzed here in a book a month. So Edgar Allan Poe, for example, were, was one of the authors we studied last semester, and, and Mary Shelley or Philip Roth was already read in here, etc. Okay. And the first question I think, which is relevant for today, we're this is an open class in which you get a flavor of what we do and how we do it, right? Um, and the first question I would have to answer is, what is a book a month? Okay. So go ahead and. Uh, this is a project uh, and a method that was developed to practice and improve language um, via literature, okay? So we learn literature, we study literature and culture, and sometimes we refer to historical events. So the idea is creating an immersion um, and by using literature, art, and culture, and, and this provides us with an uh, environment for us to practice our foreign language, for us to, to um, sometimes to analyze vocabularies, a few grammar st structures, but we are not really focusing on language, we're focusing on literature and language is a, is a side effect, a pretty, pretty pleasant one, okay? Go ahead, Anna. 
So we try to do both and we try to do it in two ways. We have two types of courses, uh, which vary according to how much time people have to read. So if they have more, if more time off is available, some people will opt for novels in which we read a book a month. So there you go. That's the name of the project. Or sometimes if we are on the run and, you know, these, these days, it's sometimes it's tough to put time aside. So then we go for the short stories course in which we read one short story every week. And it takes very quite short ones, like max 10 pages max. So the idea is that you'll be reading like up to half an hour a week and learning literature um, in this way. So what you see today is uh, an actual class that was part of last semester, uh, a class um, that, that was taught by Anna about Chinua Achebe. Okay, a great favorite of mine. Go ahead, Anna. Again. And in case you're wondering, uh, in this semester, in the, the first semester of 2023, in the short stories course, we'll be analyzing texts from all of these authors. So some of huge canonical classic authors, such as Virginia Woolf or Thomas Mann or Herman Melville, but sometimes others that are also very well known, or Lovecraft, Agatha Christie, Alice Walker, that which has received a lot of um, a lot of prizes, including the Pulitzer, and, and so on. Okay. Go ahead, Anna, please. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Aurio. Um, so, people, uh, we today are going to talk about Chino Achebe. I don't know if you have ever read any other work by, um, by Achebe before, but he is a very well known and very uh, important writer of the 20th century and contemporaneity. He is uh, from Nigeria, right? So he was born in 1930 and he passed in, the in 2013. Um, he was born in British Nigeria, which has a lot to say about the content of what he writes in his stories, right? So just for you to get um, more of an idea of what uh, Nigeria is organizing in terms of ethnic groups and linguistic groups, um, we have different kinds of uh, ethnic groups spread all over uh, the, the territory. And uh, Achebe, he concentrates the stories mostly um, in the part of Nigeria, which is very close to where he was born himself. So he's part of the Igbo um, ethnic group. And this appears a lot and is very much uh, put into context in his stories. So you will remember uh, this name because uh, even if you don't know much about the subject, um, uh, Achebe, he goes back into this and he even teaches us a little bit more. Uh, and this is also the, the topic of uh, his work, right? So I begin um, analyzing with you this um, sentence, this uh, passage from an interview from 1990 from the BBC where Chino Achebe talks a little bit about his purpose and his uh, idea of his uh, fictional work, right? What is his objective of his fictional work? And then he says uh, like this, when I was young, younger, an adventure story was simply an adventure story. And if there were good white people surrounded by cannibals or savages, my sympathies would go with the good white people. I didn't see a problem there. Later on, I began to see that these stories were saying more than they appear to be saying. Then I read them more carefully and began to feel that every people must dare tell their own story, right? So this is um, where he starts from his work, like the idea of uh, this very naive and ignorant um, concern that usually the world refers to Africa as a whole mass of people who live together, but we uh, tend to disregard the individualities in the different types of national literature and, and different cultures, which are many, many uh, in terms of all kinds of arts, of language, of uh, literary production. So he wants to add to this um, discourse, to this speech, and he actually uh, bring his own word as um, a Nigerian writer and uh, tell his story through the perspective of a person who is inside Nigerian culture and African culture, right? So he is um, very important also because uh, he, besides 
contributing with his incredible pieces of literary work, like for example, Things Fall Apart. Um, he also has uh, been part of the editing group of the Heinemann African Writer Series and has given place, given room for many other people who are also writers from African countries, uh, like uh, Nagi Mahfouz, the Egyptian writer, uh, Doris Leston, who was born in Iran, but he spent she spent a significant time in Zimbabwe. Uh, Vole Sowinka, also Nigeria, Nadine Gordman, uh, she received the Nobel Prize and uh, she's from South Africa. And also uh, he himself organizing African short, volumes of African short stories that should be read uh, for the whole world and also should be, should be read in um, English, right? Which is something that we're going to discuss later on. So besides, uh, uh, sir, yes, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, Anna. But one in interesting thing is that this this last volume of African short stories was organized in the eighties, if I'm not mistaken. It includes uh, short stories by Abdul Razak Gurna, uh, the author that won from, oh, yeah. from the African author mm -hmm. that won the Nobel Prize last year. So we're talking about. Uh, one uh, press series that was published since the 70s, 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these Nobel Prizes, they had not won any prizes at the time, you know? So, so he was pretty capable of recognizing young talents. And there are many others that are not here, right? So for yeah. example, Yugi Wathiongo from, from uh, Ghana, who is an amazing writer. Uh, he's, he was not appreciated with no, the Nobel, but but he's also publishing in this series. So it is quite outstanding, truly. Yeah, for sure. And it's uh, besides like being a, a great contribution to the history of literature, right? Which is uh, giving us, giving the world the opportunity of reading these writers. Uh, also, it uh, is uh, an important and crucial contribution to post-colonial studies. I don't know if you are familiar with the term, but uh, post-colonial studies is usually um, an interdisciplinary type of area which focuses on different types of disciplines which um, reflect about the, um, the literary production or the artistic production of countries who have been uh, former colonies, right? So in this sense, um, the works by Chinua Cheb and, all, and also these other writers that we have just seen in the last slide, they fit in the profile of post-colonial literature, mm -hmm. which often addresses these problems of, uh, and consequences also of decolonization um, of a country, and especially questions relating to the political and cultural independence of formerly subjugated people, right? So um, some of the important themes are racialism and colonialism, and some of the things that you will uh, for sure have spotted in the short story that we're discussing today, Dead Man's Path, right? So another very important point um, about Chino Achebe himself and his literary production uh, in specific, is that he chooses, he actively chooses to write in English rather than in Igbo, his uh, native language, right? Uh, we know, of course, that in Nigeria, uh, English is also an official language, but different kinds of people, of course, they do have uh, their um, native language and ethnic uh, language. So why choosing to write in English, right? And this was a heated debate at the time, and it's something that um, he was very much criticized for, and he's aware of that, and he has uh, come back to, um, to refer to these critics uh, as well. But this is something that for us is a benefit, because otherwise, if he had written in, in other languages, in Igbo, for instance, it would be very unlikely that we would have been uh, hearing from him and discussing him today, right? We know like in, in Brazilian uh, literature, for instance, it is very difficult for us to reach the same places as English speaking countries in terms of literary uh, practice, right? So for us, it's a great benefit. And of course, it's something that he has chosen to do actively, mostly because of the reach uh, that English has and to be able to communicate what he wants to say, right? So it's part of his uh, literary uh, universe as well. Yes, Al, oh, please. And just, just another comment uh, uh, regarding that. Um, some authors have started and adopted the same strategy and then change it later on. So this is the case of Ngugi Wathiongo that I have just mentioned, 
Um, he also published in the early 60s in English and, and slowly changed his language of locution to, and nowadays he, he writes in Gikuyu, for example, one, one of the official languages of Ghana and his mother, mother tongue. So it's, it's pretty interesting that how they use English to, to gain acceptance uh, uh, internationally, and then you can enrich the, the, the debate. And this is true about uh, the Anglophone uh, literature, but it's also true about uh, from uh, Francophone literature as well. There are many authors that decide to do exactly the same thing using French or sometimes even using German, because we have to remember there were also many German colonies and even uh, Italian ones actually in, in, in Africa. Uh, and this is why, this is why in, in the book a month, we, we take a quite a different approach to literature. Uh, because we do not really teach English literature, but we teach literatures in English. Okay, so that's that that might seem irrelevant or quite small, but actually it's it's tremendous, it's huge, because we we are not uh, proposing to teach just one thing. There is literature, this fixed thing. Uh, we talk about a plurality here. We, we're teaching literatures in English and. We do that in order to encompass people like Chinua Achebe or people like Jamaica Kincaid, for example, from, from uh, Central America, or Jean Riss, right? So she is from Dominica, if I'm not mistaken. Dominica, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so White Sargasso Sea was, was written directly in English. Or Jhumpalahiri, for example, she's Indian, just uh, Narayam, uh, he's a very renowned and, and extremely praised author from India that did exactly the same, same thing as Achebe, decided not to write in Hindi, but rather in English. And, and so I'm, I'm using these examples because these are authors and texts we have already studied in the book a month. And then the bigger one, Harun and the Sea of Stories, is one of the reads in, in one of our course uh, this semester by Salman Rushdie, big name. The guy is uh, he's 84 right now. He has survived already five assassination attempts uh, and he has escaped all of them. So we decided to, to read one of his stories as a, as a way to, to homage uh, his, uh, he, he's very known for Midnight Children, a book about the independence of India, uh, which talks about magical realism. Uh, so it's very interesting, an Indian writer taking exactly the same path. So this is why we talk about literatures in English and not only about English literature. Although we all love Jane Austen, uh, of yes. course. <laughs> and, and of course, like when we're talking about English uh, literature, we're uh, trying to dismiss the idea of the adjective, which defines that this literature is only English literature if it comes from the UK, right? So if it doesn't come from the UK, but it's also produced, uh, produced in English, then it's not Anglophone literature, right? Or literature... Uh, written in English. So it's it's very uh, relevant that we do this kind of work, mostly to understand um, the um, production, the literary production in English as something as uh, an Anglophone world. Does, just as we do it with Portuguese, right? We have different nations who speak Portuguese, not only Portugal, not only Brazil, but many uh, other countries do, and they do produce literary works also in uh, in Portuguese, right? So this is really important for us. Um, all right, so uh, when we think about Chino Achebe, of course, we have to address uh, the, the beautiful 1958 novel, Things Fall Apart. Um, it's actually a life-changing story, people. It's, it's really uh, simply written, but it's, it's something that it goes uh, deep uh, not only in your conscious, but also in your soul. <laughs> so it's it's something uh, good to um, to know more about uh, Nigerian literary production, and it features um, the life of Okonko in pure colonial uh, life in southeastern uh, Nigeria, which is the region of Igbo culture, uh, which we have showed you in the beginning of the, the meeting today. And also it is divided in two parts, like the first part is pre-colonial life. And then the second part is after the European invasion and the effects of colonialism in, in a country and in a nation, right? So it's pretty relevant in many ways. And I'm sure you will uh, feel the need to, to read it uh, once you have the chance, right? 
And this is also uh, something that resonates in the works of many other writers, many contemporary writers, for example, as uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, very well known, very well praised uh, writer. And uh, in 2021, I think we read Purple Hibiscus. And uh, besides, uh, she uh, acknowledged, like publicly acknowledging her influence um, of uh, Chino Achebe's literature. In the beginning of Purple Hibiscus, the first paragraph, the first line of it is things fall apart, right? So there's not um, a more clear homage to the literature of Chino Achebe than this. Um, also very good um, uh, novel. We were also thinking of uh, getting back to bringing more Chimamanda Dichi for the future uh, reading list of a book a month, right? All right, so now we properly begin with discussing Dead Man's Path, a 1953 short story by uh, Achebe, right? So um, I'm, I'm thinking that all of you have read uh, the text. So it's a very short text, about three to four pages. Um, it's a very interesting story, and it summarizes the stories of these main characters, mostly Michael Obi and his uh, wife, Nancy um living in uh the inlands of nigeria michael obi is the headmaster of the school nancy is his wife and um the story plot is around this cultural clash and cultural um uh, battle between what is considered to be modern and good and civilized and what is considered to be uh, primitive, bad, and old, and uh, outdated, right? So uh, we also have other uh, characters who are very important to the story as well. For instance, the village priest, which is referred to as the Ani priest, uh, the government inspector, and the people, which are always referred to in the plural, right? They don't have like different individuals, but they're just like the people. And they do have a very important voice and we're gonna talk about it in a few seconds. All right, so um, the opening lines of, um, of the short story, it's very important for us, uh, mostly because it sets the tone of who the characters are and who uh, are the people that we are talking about and, and what is the setting, right? So you're gonna notice that uh, in each of the slides, we all have we are, have introduced some like very um, uh, humble glossary here, just to help you out with some of the words. I don't know. I'm just anticipating. You might know them, but just here if you need them. Okay. So I'm gonna read the opening lines for you. Michael Obi's hopes were fulfilled much earlier than he had expected. He was appointed headmaster of Indumis Central School in January 1949. It had always been an unprogressive school, so the mission authorities decided to send a young and energetic man to run it. Obi accepted this responsibility with enthusiasm. He had many wonderful ideas, and this was an opportunity to put them into practice. He had had se sound secondary school education, with designated him, uh, which designated him a pivotal teacher in the official records and set him apart from the other headmasters in the mission field. He was outspoken in his condemnation of the narrow views of these older and often less educated ones, and outspoken as frankly stating um, his ideas about um, these old uh methods of teaching and this old uh traditions that he considered to be uh debated right so in essence michael Obi represents uh some of the most important um dichotomies and dualities that the literature of achebe presents on its whole right the duality or the dualism between modern and what is modern and what is primitive what is considered to be civilized and what is considered to be uncivilized, uncivilized, um, the imposed culture of uh, the, the uh, metropolis and also the local culture of the colonies and former colonies, um, and also the debate between, uh, in this case, Christianism uh, and the Igbo religions. And I'm saying in this case, Christianism, because there are other uh, short stories by Achebe, which also refer to the um, uh, Muslim part of Nigeria, right? Because also Nigeria does have um, Muslims in the 
House of Polony part in the north. And also um, the um, uh, duality between what is young and good and modern and awesome and what is bad and old and all the, the downsides of society, right? So it's uh, uh, the embodiment of all of these dualities which is uh, are stated in uh, Michael Obis figure right so i'm just going to comment something that for me it's very it's um it's something important to to refer to as i told you uh before like chino achebe he was born in british nigeria so he also had take uh, he take he took a um, christian name right what considered to be westernized name the same thing as michael Obi. so we have a last name which is nigerian the same thing for uh, Chinualumogo Achebe and the first name, Michael and Albert, right? In an interview, the same interview that I showed you before of the BBC in the 1990s, um, Achebe tells the interviewer that he has dropped Albert from his name and he has remained with a shorter version of Chinualumogo Achebe. And these names, they are very significant if we analyze this, not only the name of the character, but also the name of Achebe himself. So Michael Obi, Obi metaphorically means heart, right? This is the meaning of the, the word, but also can mean something which stays in the center, right? So Obi in uh, an Igbo uh, homestead is actually the central beauty. So usually when we are talking about, uh, for example, the kitchen is the heart of the house, right? We say that in Portuguese a lot. Uh, he is saying that he, this name is actually referring to this centrality of something that occupies a very important place in a society, the same thing as the heart in the human body, right? So uh, this is the, um, uh, the importance of Michael Obi. He is the headmaster of the school, right? So he takes a very uh, prestigious position and he has authority, yeah. And uh, Chino Achebe, his name Chino Alomogo, means uh, that may his chi fight for him, right? And chi means a personal spirit which is assigned to every individual, something that in Christian terms we would refer to as a guardian angel or something like this, right? So his name means may his chi fight for him. So it's very meaningful in all of the cases, therefore, um, the introduction and the choice of uh, these names to refer to uh, this character and also for Achebe to introduce his own identity to the world, yeah? And then we have Nancy, uh, which we assume that also her last name is Nancy Obi, right? But Nancy is uh, Michael Obi's wife. And uh, although she doesn't have much of a participation in the story, her participation actually is very relevant for the symbology of what we're going to refer to as a um, colonialism criticism. So in this uh, excerpt, this is when we have the first introduction uh, of Nancy. In their two years of married life, she had become completely infected by his passion for modern methods. And his denigration of these and um, these old and superannuated people in the teaching field who would be better employed as mm -hmm. traders in the Onicha market. She began to see herself already as the admired wife of the young handmaster, the queen of the school, which varies, uh, is, is very similar to an idea of like the homecoming queen of uh, the, the American proms. So she is re, uh, thinking of herself occupying this very prestigious position as the wife of the headmaster, but also in very westernized terms, yes? Um, and this is the Onicha market that uh, he refers to he says that uh, the teachers who are already based in the school they should better be teaching in this market and you see that this is a, like a, a very common market very popular one uh but what he means is not something good obviously right he is uh, making a very prejudiced comment right so it's um super uh, interesting the the reference and the metaphor that he's using here um, and Nancy herself, like uh, the, the text, what it, the text is actually trying to say to us is that uh, she has an image of herself of what she wants and wishes to be, 
to that society. And this is not something local. This is not something uh, Nigerian or equal. It's something else. It's westernized. It's Americanized in many centuries, right? So what she says uh, in in one of the, the I think is the next paragraph. He is a little bit uh, pensive, and she says like a penny for your thoughts, Mike. Right? Using this very um, American um, kind of expressions. Send Nancy after a while imitating the woman's magazine she read, right? So also this idea of imitating uh, a foreign culture that comes to her um, through different kinds of means, right? So it's a very interesting um, uh, character, mostly because it's through her that we are get to have we get to have access to another kind uh, of symbology that Achebe is constructing to us here. And it's very much connected to the way that she cares for the school, the, the way that she uh, organizes um, everything, right? So um, this is a long excerpt, but I think it's worth it. So Indumi school was backward in every sense of the word. Uh, Mr. Obi put his whole life in the work and his wife her too. Hers too. He had two aims. A high standard of teaching was insisted upon, and the school compound was to be turned into a place of beauty. Nancy's dream gardens came to life with the coming of the rains and blossomed. Beautiful hibiscus and alamander hedges in brilliant red and yellow marked, marked out the carefully tended school compound from the rank neighborhood bushes. One evening, as Obi was admiring his work, he was scandalized to see an old woman from the village hobble right across the compound through a marigold flower bed in the hedges. On going up there, he found faint signs of an almost disused path from the village across the school compound to the bush on the other side. It amazes me, said Obi to one of his teachers, who had been three years in the school, that you people allow the villagers to make use of this footpath. It is simply incredible, he shook his head. The path, said the teacher apologetically, appears to be very important to them. Although it is hardly used, it connects the village shrine with the place of burial, right? So this is when we are first introduced um, to the path. And uh, here are some of the species that are mentioned in the story. And these are the species that Nancy chose to construct her garden. And um, as a specialist in ecocriticism and animal studies, as I am, I did my PhD and also my postdoctorate on the subject. Uh, this kind of species, they, they seem suspicious for me. So after researching them a little bit, um, we got to the result that all of them, not only uh, these two, but also the hibiscus, they are native uh, to other other parts of the world, but not uh, from Nigeria, not even from the continent of Africa. So uh, the marigolds are the uh, commonly referred as the Gites, and the Alamanda, they are both from uh, native uh, to the Americas, and hibiscus is probably native to China, right? So they also refer uh, to these um, other places where uh, have also been former colonies, um, from um, European colonizers. And it actually refers to something that I understand as a symbology of colonialism, right? Because she actively chooses to plant those in, um, instead of choosing native uh, flowers, right? And um, there's also this curiosity that this um, a specific form of uh, marigold, the Tagitis minuta, is used in some African countries as a pioneer species, mm -hmm. which means um, it's a species that is used to improve the soil uh, that are uh, considered to be barren, like infertile, right? Um, and you see that the word that uh, is used in the definition is colonize barren environments, right? So here we have, it's very, um, it, it, the symbology is actually coming to life. The idea that um, something that uh, Alfred Crosby, the famous historian, has identified in his 1986 um, bestseller, Ecological Imperialism, the Bio Biological Expansion of Euro Europe, uh, he refers to as that um, together with colonial settlers, not only did uh, diseases and other people come to the different kinds of the world, but also the species, right? The species of plants, the species of animals. And this is uh, what I think Achebe is referring to when creating 
the story. So although Nancy seems to be harmless and is, seems to be like um, lacking agency in the story, she does have agency and it's uh, hidden in the symbologies, right? So after the story continues, we know that um, uh, Obi decides to close the pass, right? In order to prevent uh, the, the people from crossing uh, the, the grounds of the school in order to conduct their uh, spiritual burials. And uh, he even uses barbed wire, like Arami Farpado, right? He uses barbed wire in order to impede uh, the people to do it, right? And of course, this action uh, was perceived by the people as um, an authoritarian kind of action, right? And because of that, he was confronted by the community priest. And this is where the community priest enters in the story. Yeah. And uh, after confronting um, Obi, he says, look here, my son, said the priest, bringing down his walking stick. This path was here before you were born and before your father was born. The whole life of this village depends on it. Our dead relatives, uh, relatives depart by it and our ancestors visit us by it. But most important, it is the path of children coming to be born. Mr. Obi listened with a satisfied smile on his face. The whole purpose of our school, he said finally, is to eradicate just such beliefs as that. Dead men do not require fruit facts. The whole idea is just fantastic. Our duty as a school is to teach our children to laugh at such ideas. What you say may be true, replied the priest, but we follow the practices of our fathers. If you reopen the path, we shall have nothing to quarrel about. What I always say is, let the hawk perch and let the eagle perch. He rose to go. And what he's saying uh, in, when he uses the sentence is, let the hawk perch and let the eagle perch is like, if you continue to do this, your doom is going to be brought by, uh, onto you by yourself, right? And the bottom line is, um, if you don't believe it, if you think this is outdated, if you think this is primitive, just let the others believe what they want to believe. And uh, if you do not agree, just so be it. But let the others exert uh, their own agency. But we know that uh, Michael Wolby refers to, um, to this as something that he is very decided and determined about. And then he decides to maintain the um, uh, the footpath close, and because of that, the 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 whole school the next day uh, it becomes uh, completely destroyed. Right. Two days later, a young woman in the village died in childbed. A diviner was immediately consulted, and he prescribed heavy sacrifices to propitiate ancestors insulted by the fence, right? And to propitiate here is actually gain the favor of uh, the deities. So Obi woke up next morning among the ruins of his work. The beautiful hedges were torn up, not just near the path, but right round the school. The flowers trampled to dust, and one of the school buildings pulled down. That day, the white supervisor came to inspect the school and wrote a nasty report on the state of the premises, but more seriously noted about the tribal war situation developing between the school and the village, arising in pass from the misguided zeal of the new headmaster, right? So because he insisted on keeping the foot uh, pass closed, therefore the people, which is now this group, which is considered something collective, something anonymous, some, something not individual, they acted and um, they uh, majored justice uh, by themselves. And I have highlighted here, people, this term tribal war, as because uh, the idea of referring to different peoples as um, tribes, it's something that uh, Achebe, he has commented in many interviews saying that it's something that, of course, he criticizes, but he is trying to convey um, this idea uh, that sees um, uh, the traditional cultures of Nigerian peoples and Igbo people as nothing uh, other than the other, than the foreign than the savages that um, he talks about when he wants to contribute uh, to his story. So it's very interesting that uh, he has decided to collect things like that, right? So, um, and this is also something that, uh, yes, yeah, please. 
May I just say something? And I, I believe Obi uses the word tribal before, right? So, so actually, by using this tribal war, uh, we get the idea that he is to blame for his own demise, right? Which he is actually. <laughs> it's all his fault. He brought it upon himself, right? So um, we know this on many levels, and the usage of the word tribal um, also marks that symbolically, right? And also marks uh, which side he's in, right? Because he is a local, right? He's not a foreigner. He's not a white person. Um, he was uh, uprought and raised in Nigeria. So therefore, like he, his allegiances are elsewhere. And uh, this is what the, the context uh, means to criticize here. Right. And um, Chino Achebe, he talks uh, about something that to me, find, I find it very precise um, about what uh, is being presented here in the short story. He says in the same interview, uh, I can link it to you before, uh, afterwards, uh, if you want to, no matter how powerful a man is, he is less powerful than his people, right? So what he's saying is it doesn't, it, like, it's not going to do. If you're going to fight um, these people, then probably you're going to lose because Igbo culture is about the community, right? It's not about only the individuals, right? It's about the, the power of the community. Yes. So uh, back to you all. <laughs> we are like reporters. Actually, I believe we're super fast today. Um, do you guys have, before I, I go on, do you guys have any comments on the story or questions? Um, actually, I would like to say something. Um, yes, I, I am, I got my bachelor's degree in international relations. And we actually studied a little bit about the white man's burden. And I completely, it was like, I couldn't think of anything else. And like the white man's burden and this relation of them versus us. But as also Anna said, he is not a white person. He's not a foreigner. And he's just, he felt like the treacherous elite, you know, that we also have here in Brazil. So, and I really, really loved this short story. And well, that's it. <laughs> oh, that's uh, great. Idea. Great to see you, Anna, because now I, I recognize your last name. <laughs> Good to see you, uh, you in person virtually, right? So thank you very much for your comment. And it, it, that's, uh, that is precisely right. But uh, the, the one thing that I also think it's very important for us to remark on is that although um, Michael Obi, he puts himself in this position, he also is, uh, in some cases, I think he's also like, uh, like the text is trying to tell us the fragility and the vulnerability of the whole thing, right? Because in the end, he was punished not uh, acclaimed by the people that he wanted to um, impress, right? So in the end, he, he lost, and he lost not only uh, amongst his own, but also through the eyes of the, the others that he wanted to impress, right? So it's, it's something very uh, symbolic, yeah? And just to, to explain a little bit what Anna was talking about, The White Man's Burden is a poem that was written by Ribyard Kipling, very famous author from English literature. It was written in the end of the 19th century. And it's a poem about the expansion of the British Empire. So we have to remember that um, it was in the, the end of the 19th century that most of Africa and Asia were occupied by Europe, right? So when coming from Brazil, when we talk about colonialism, we usually think about 1500s, 1600s before our independence. And actually, we forgot, we forget that for most countries in Africa and Asia, the, the century of colonialization was the 19th century. It was not the, the, the 16th, like, like in our case. Uh, and so at this time, he writes this poem in, in which he talks about the burden. And you see, the burden is something heavy, something that you are obliged to carry, right? So he talks about the burden that Europe has to colonize the world, right? So, because of course they, they are coming to, to South Africa, not because the mines of diamonds and not to be rich, of course they're coming to help and to save and etc. 
So this poem is, is extremely racist, very xenophobic, and, and very polemic, but also paradoxically very musical. It's a very sing-song uh, poem, you know, like very nice rhyme. So it's a, it's a very, it's much discussed nowadays uh, among literary scholars. And what you have is exactly this idea of what Anna was talking about. Um, uh, um, dichotomy as, as if Europe had all the knowledge and everything else was trash. Um, and, and I mean, we, we love Europe. There are many good things over there, but we love the entire world. There are many good things all over the planet. So, so yeah, so this is it's what the white man's burden means. Go ahead. Anna. I can actually send you the, the link because it usually is referred to in several caricatures in the 19th century. I don't know if you ever seen one, uh, which is, I think it's like a, a man uh, going up, a, climbing up a mountain and he's carrying different kinds. He's, he's like the, the, this man is like the white man's burden. He's carrying different kinds of uh, peoples, different ethnicities uh, on his back, right? And this is his burden to carry on them, to carry them on to uh, towards civilization, right? So this duty, yeah, which is very symbolic for what we're talking about here, yes. Um, all right, so would, would you like to carry on and we uh, come back to the comments later on or? Okay, we... so I'll just yeah. present to you guys the rest of the, of the project. So this is what we usually do in short stories. Uh, there is another type of course that we offer, which is called novels, in which we read like longer texts. So short stories are up to 10 pages. Uh, and novels, it depends. We, there are two levels, let's, let's put it this way, intermediate and advanced. And we try to stay within the range of 100, 150 pages a month for the intermediate and 200, 250 max for the advanced, right? So one, when um, choosing um, courses at a book a month, the, the key question is how much would you like to read? And please go ahead, Anna. And also how often would you like to, oh, so sorry. And, and this is for, to give you one example, uh, our reading list for this semester in the intermediate course. We also organize our courses thematically. This is one of the different ways on how we handle literature. When you studied literature at high school, probably you did so chronologically. You probably studied only Brazilian literature uh, and probably you did it chronologically. So the oldest thing, the, the older things before, and then you probably stopped somewhere in the 1960s. You probably did not reach contemporary literature. Uh, this is not how we do it here. We, we like it that there are many advantages in doing this chronologically, but we don't, we don't really like to divide literature according to nationalities. We, try, we like to divide it according to languages. So that's why we teach literatures in English. And even that is too, it's too small for us, okay? So we, we like very much a concept that is called global literature because we are fans of liter literature. So anything, written texts, it can be Japanese, it can be Chinese, it can be... I don't know, Igbo, I don't care. If it's good literature, I'm interested in it, you know? Uh, and so this is why we, 85% of what we do here is uh, written originally in English, but there is a 10% that comes from other languages. We use sometimes translations uh, because they are great works of art. So this is the case in this semester. Uh, we'll, in, in this, uh, in the novels intermediate course, we'll be discussing Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse a Nobel Prize of 1946, German, very poetic, spiritual book, beautiful, beautiful reading. And also we'll be discussing Camus, uh, great, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century uh, who wrote uh, The Stranger, so We Estrangeiro in Portuguese, right? Uh, the Stranger uh, at the beginning of the century, and it's a great read in French, uh, so we're reading it in translation. Uh, why are we doing that? Why did we decide to, to, to read those two texts, one coming from German and the other from French literature? Uh, first, because they are masterpieces, but also because we like to organize our courses thematically. So this, go ahead, Anna, please. We'll be talking about happiness and, and difficulties in life. Uh, and, and, and they really fit. They really fit in, 
in the broader cultural discussions that we would like to, to make. So this is why we have a certain itinerary in all of our courses. We'll start this time with, uh, can you go back, Anna, please? With The Wizard of Oz, a text that is a kind of allegory of life, a very a great, a great text from the 1900s. Then we move on into Siddhartha, something that's very much related to Buddhism and the real Buddha, the Siddhartha Gautama that appears in the story, actually. And then we'll talk about uh, The Stranger that is not happy at all, right? So this book is about uh, actually something that is lacking rather than something that is present. Uh, we will read a great classic, the, the Secret Garden, a book about healing, about friendship, about uh, being in contact with nature. And finally, my personal favorite of this semester, uh, Canary Row by John Steinbeck. We all know the Steinbeck, the author of, of Mice and Men, of Grapes of Wrath. This guy has been touched by the fingers of the gods. You know, everything he wrote is amazing. If you find his list for the supermarket, please read it because it's going to be amazing. I have no, no doubts. Uh, and this one is about some friends that try to, to throw a party, a surprise party, and, and actually they end up destroying the place. So it's a little bit like... Si beber non case, let's put it this way. <laughs> <laughs> but poetic. <laughs> yeah. 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 And also we have already read uh, The Grapes of Wrath in past years. I think it was 2020 uh, by Sean, Joe Steinbeck as well, right? So it's he is a great writer. Uh, so I, I highly uh, recommend you reading the story because it's, it's amazing for sure. But one of the, the key things about Steinbeck is most of his text, he's using like slangs and, and regional language. And so it is difficult for us to understand as foreigners because, you know, they really speak uh, as the, in, in local dialect. This one is a bit different. So this is why it's in the intermediate text. All of the texts are original and they are unabridged. So they were not manipulated in any way. The, the, what we search for is we, we actively search for easier to read, but not necessarily less complex or less artistic, okay? We're looking more for the linguistic level rather than anything else. Please go on, Anna. Then the advanced course in, in the novels uh, tra trajectory. Uh, in, in this semester, we'll be talking about traveling, something that I believe we all love to do, I guess. Um, we also start with great, great classics. So Ernest Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises. Uh, a work that many consider to be his masterpiece, although Hemingway has also written so many good stuff. Um, then we move in, on to Jack Kerouac's The Dharma Bums. So probably you have heard about On the Road, right? This is the, his most famous novel. And this is the prequel for this story, okay? So uh, this is the, let's put it, the continuation of On the Road. And it's about two friends um, that are hitchhiking together. They are... They go mountain climbing, they go trekking. It's, it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of talk about Buddhism as well. Then we move into East Wind, West Wind by Pearl S. Buck. Uh, and this, uh, did anyone ever hear of anything about Pearl S. Buck? Can you guys write in the comments? Yes, Angela, yes. Anybody else? Just for me to have uh, uh, some statistics. Yeah, she, she is really not really well known, okay? She's, she's uh, uh, poorly known. And, and I find that amazing because she won both the Pulitzer and the Nobel, okay? So probably the two biggest prizes out there, she won, she won not one of them, but both of them, okay? So it's a mystery for me why she's not really so much discussed and and so and so really because she's female, right? <laughs> this is this is yeah, the thing because she's a woman, yeah. and this is this is our job here also to to bring these people to you. And because we are able to read them in the original in English, then we are able to introduce to a wider audience an author uh, who really deserves the place of being read as such, right? Yeah, and please don't don't think I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, pointing fingers, okay? Because uh, my surprise also. Um, I, I, I myself included in my surprise because it took me years to to first meet Pearl S. Buck, and and I'm a PhD in literature, so uh, the blame is actually much more on me than, than, than anyone else, right? 
So this book is about a marriage between uh, two Chinese people, but one of them was educated in the USA, so something similar with this short story that we have read today. Then we move to The Left Hand of God by Ursula Le Guin, a great classic uh, of sci-fi. It's about a human diplomat that comes to a new planet. And in this planet, there is no gender. Everybody is both male and female at, at different points. Everybody can become pregnant. Uh, and so she starts to imagine a society in which there is no sex. Everybody is, is the same, let's put it this way, biologically. So it's, it's very, very interesting, very touching as well as a story. And finally, Haroon and the Sea of Stories, uh, a kind of re-rendering of the Thousand and One Nights by Salman Rushdie. Very colorful text, super funny. Um, so, so yeah, and then quite small as well. Uh, so we will end up the semester with this fantastic trip uh, in which Haroon really, he goes to the Sea of Stories. So it's a, like a parallel world in which all the, from, from which all the stories come from. Uh, please go yes. ahead, Anna. Just a comment. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the face of Salman Rushdie, but if you have never, probably if you remember the first the first films of um, Bridget Jones' Diary, he does a participation in, there is like this launching of Kafka something, uh, Kafka on a motorbike, they're probably making a pun with Murakami's uh, Kafka on the shore, and then on this launching party, um, Salman Rushdie is among, is among the, the invited uh, people and Bridget Jones just like uh, uh, mispronounces his name or something like this so and he's a he's a, um, a very interesting person in many ways just also something that I would like to add people although people uh, tend to and, and I mean like various uh, people that have uh, talked to us before about uh, being afraid if they're going to be able to read those texts right in the first place because they are part of the advanced readings Ernest Hemingway, for instance, his, his text is very easy, right? His, um, the complexity of his texts are mostly um, not on the surface of the text, not on the language, but actually on the ideas, right? So uh, this is where it goes. So to achieve that, of course, we're going to be helping you out uh, all the way and mediating the, uh, the reading. But uh, these texts, they're not very, very long. We choose them carefully to be like that. So you are able to achieve the goals of reading, but also uh, according to the specific levels that we have uh, proposed to you here, right? So continue, please. Yeah, so, so this is all about traveling. And go ahead, Anna. Yeah, and then uh, our classes will start from February, uh, all of them, and, and in all of them, we start straight away with discussions of this uh, Kate Chopin in the short stories, The Wizard of Oz in the novels Intermediate, and The Sun Also Rises in the novels Advanced. Uh, but uh, the next week, we'll offer an, an, another open class with advice on how to read, actually, in foreign languages, not only in English. Um, we, we both, both me and Anna, we, we speak several languages and we, we have a habit of reading in many languages. And actually uh, a book a month has started as an, in certain, in certain ways as an expansion of that. So it's something that we really practice and, and we have advice to share on, on that regard. So um, if you guys want to check it out, please come. You're always a welcome. You, have, you will have a, a forever to, to uh, really to submit once again your, your information in this link that I sent to you in the chat. And that's it. It will be on the 19th of January, so next Thursday. And yeah, we were, we were actually afraid that we would not have enough time, but actually, yeah. Yeah, no, I was rushing because I thought I was uh, too late, but then it means that we have more time uh, to discuss. So we thank you for now, but of course, I have prepared some questions that I would like to ask you, right? And these are uh, the three conducting classes, because um, originally in one A Book A Month class, we do have a separate time that we're going to introduce formally the literary work for you as um, I did for you today. And then uh, all of us, uh, both Aru and I, we organize different activities to be able to conduct your reading, either to give you time for exploring some of um, the subjects that we have suggested uh, to you to do it in bigger groups or in smaller groups, 
um, but also that everybody has the opportunity to speak and also do something that is very um, that a book of is, get is is very keen on, which is to give you time to practice your English, right? Which is to speak more about what you think uh, concerning the um, the ideas that we have discussed in each of the classes, right? Um, so three questions for you, and of course these are just invitations. If you want to say something other, just uh, let us know. Yes, Audi. And uh, just give me 30 seconds uh, before we start, because Renata has made an interesting question in the chat. Ah, okay. If the short stories course also is organized them thematically. And the answer is no, uh, because the idea for the short stories is actually to, to give you as many impressions as possible. So it's like, you know, before you, you marry, you, you go to different restaurants and try a little bit of everything of their food, right? So the idea is exactly the same. We read usually two, sometimes three short stories uh, from many authors. Um, and so we, we stick with them for two weeks, at least sometimes for three weeks. Uh, and the idea is, is to give you a broad uh, experience of, of many different schools, different different times, different perspectives. So this is why we'll be, uh, and, and we use the short stories course as well to read great classics that are a bit too difficult. For example, Melville, Moby Dick is a, it's brilliant. It's impossible. It's great, <laughs> but it's huge and it's very difficult. So yeah. instead of reading Moby Dick, we try shorter stuff. Sometimes they're also not so easy, but they are shorter. They're like five pages long, so you can survive it. So, so this is why the same applies to Virginia Woolf, an author that we love, but it's so difficult that sometimes it's difficult yeah. to use for like the longer uh, um, texts. So, so this is why we try to make a greater range, a great, a great uh, array of, of different things. And we try to vary. Some things are funny, some things are tragic. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of variation over there. Yeah, and it's usually like uh, we we like to see ourselves as literature sommeliers, something like this. Usually, when you go to breweries, you ask, you have the opportunity of asking like very small cups of different kinds of flavors of shoppies or beers, right? And then you get the chance to taste all of them and choose the ones that you like uh, to drink most, and then you ask for a pint or a bigger portion. This is more or less how we do it because. Um, well, I have been teaching the, the short story since the beginning, right? And what the students uh, say is that uh, the short stories is the entrance door, and then soon enough, they are looking for uh, other works by these writers that we have discussed in class, their novels, other short stories, and uh, maybe even poetry and uh, other possibilities of reading, right? Which is also not only about uh, what you're reading at the time, but also the action uh, of um, stimulating literature and the habit of reading, which is something that we uh, see ourselves as uh, people who are doing like this kind of influencing, right? Uh, helping you out with the, the reading. Yeah. People, any more questions before we discuss uh, the text a little bit further? No? All right, so three questions for you. These are invitations. You, of course, you can talk about anything you want. You can make any comments. Um, but first, like, how did you like the story? If it was a good reading, uh, if you liked the experience, how it was in terms of uh, language? If it was difficult, easy. Um, second question: Is there a villain in the story? Something that I find very interesting when we discuss these types of texts. Um, and I find uh, very interesting because I created uh, this question most envisaging an idea of what Achebe talks in one of his interviews uh, to the Library of uh, Congress, saying that he never creates um, heroes in his stories without flaws, right? To be a true hero, you have to have a flaw, otherwise you're not human, right? And he says that, which to me, refers exactly to what Michael Obi is. He is a well, like he's a good intended person, but he uh, brings up his own doom to himself without even knowing and noticing. Right? So uh, the question to you, is there a villain in the story? And how do you rate the end? Or what do you find uh, of the end, right? How do you analyze it? Okay, so these questions are here. Um, we are going to stop the sharing now. If you want to speak up, 
maybe just raise your hand and then we give uh, the, the word to uh, whoever wants to speak. Or also you can use the chat and we 